Good evening. I'm Susan Galassi, Senior Curator at the Frick Collection, and I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to this evening's lecture by Daniel Robbins, the second in a series of programs held in connection with the exhibition Leighton's Flaming June, on view at the Frick through September 6. On loan from the Museo de Arte de Ponce in Puerto Rico, Flaming June is the masterpiece of the late 19th century British artist Frederick Leighton. It appears here with an extraordinary preparatory oil sketch generously lent by a private collector. It's with particular pleasure that we welcome Mr. Robbins, the senior curator of Leighton House in London, Frederick Leighton's former home and studio, which is now a museum dedicated to his life and work. Mr. Robbins was a collaborator in our presentation of Flaming June, generously sharing his expertise and making available the museum's resources at every step of the way. It was with particular pleasure uh, that I had to, looking at him with the many preparatory drawings for Flaming June, which are in the collection of Leighton House. Before coming to Leighton House, Mr. Robbins studied at the Glasgow Academy and, and at the University of Warwick in Coventry. In 1990, following his studies, he took part in a project to build a house in Glasgow that had been designed in 1901 by the architect Charles René Mackintosh. The House for an Art Lover, which opened in 1996, is now a thriving exhibition event and studio space. From there, Mr. Robbins became a curator for the, for the Glasgow Museums, where he was responsible for the Macintosh collections and the furniture and woodwork collections. Among the exhibitions he organized was a major show on Macintosh that traveled in 1997 from Glasgow to the Art Institute of Chicago, the Los Angeles County Museum, and to the Metropolitan Museum. For the past 16 years, Mr. Robbins has served as senior curator of both Leighton House and another house museum in London known as 18 Stafford Terrace, the former home of the 19th century illustrator and cartoonist Edward Lindley Sanborn. In this position, he is responsible for the care and operation of both houses and their collections, and he oversees the exhibition programming and acquisitions. Under his leadership, Leighton House underwent a major refurbishment that was carried out between 2008 and 2010, and it earned awards from the Royal Institute of British Architects and the European Union of Cultural Heritage. In addition to his management of the institutions, Mr. Robbins has organized more than 40 exhibitions at Leighton House and produced numerous publications, including a book on the history and design of the house and Frederick Leighton's life and work there. This will be the subject of his lecture tonight. From his house museum to ours, please join me in welcoming Daniel Robbins. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Susan, for that very generous uh, uh, welcome. Before starting, I just wanted to say that for anybody who has Leighton's best interests at heart, to see his Flaming June exhibited here so beautifully uh, in the surroundings of the Frick Collection and presented to a New York audience, not absolutely for the first time, as I've just learnt this evening, um, really is a, a, a wonderful moment, and I'd like to congratulate Susan and the whole team here on making this uh, making this happen. And then from a personal point of view, just to extend my gratitude for this invitation and this wonderful opportunity to talk a little bit more about Leighton and specifically Leighton in connection with the wonderful house that he built in London that has now become Leighton House Museum and which I was rather scared to hear I've been for 16 years the custodian. Um, so I wanted to uh, start with this. Uh, four images of Leighton, if you like, the four ages of Leighton, that in themselves suggest something of the trajectory of his career. The image on the left, the first recorded oil by him, sadly now lost, painted in uh, 1845 when Leighton is 15, 16 years old in Florence. His sister, 
was, uh, felt it was not a good likeness, and I think you can see he's rather over-preoccupied with his reflection. Um, but still, there is a sign here of useful promise, and it's significant because it coincides with the moment when Leighton first announced to his father, a doctor, of his intention of becoming an artist. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the father was not very uh, welcoming with that idea, but then relented on the basis that Leighton could become an artist if he endeavoured to become an eminent artist. <laughs> the trouble for Leighton was that his father lived to be 92, uh, only predeceasing him by four years, so he had a very long period of time in which to demonstrate quite how eminent he'd become. If we move on to the second image, painted in 1852, Leighton uh, aged 22 years old, probably painted to mark the end of his formal training at the Stadelsche Kunstinstitut in Frankfurt. Already his accomplishment as a painter evident in the wonderful representation of his sleeve and of course his palette prominently displayed. And there's something too in the artful arrangement of his hair, carefully center parted of his consciousness of himself as an artist. And I think the presentation of himself as an artist was something that never left him and is very apparent in all the photographs or many of the photographs that, that, that exist of him. The third image jumps forward 20 years, not this time a self-portrait, but a portrait by his great friend and near neighbor, George Frederick Watts, which we'll look at in a little more detail later on in the, in the lecture. But Leighton very much in his prime here, uh, 41 years old, a full Royal Academician, increasingly involved in Royal Academy affairs. This portrait was presented to him by Watts and remained in his possession up until his death. And then 10 years further on again, and the portrait on the right, commissioned in 1880 by the Uffizi Gallery in Florence to take its place in the wonderful sequence of artists' self-portraits there. Leighton now, Sir Frederick Leighton, the president of the Royal Academy. Here, his uh, Medal of Office tucked inside his gown, signifying his recent uh, award of an honorary doctorate from Oxford University uh, uh, as a doctor of civil law, um, which itself echoes Reynolds' self-portrait. Um, and one scholar has suggested that Leighton, whether consciously or subconsciously, has integrated or merged the features of Michelangelo into his own. And there is certainly evidence through his house of a very close association or affinity with, with the work of Michelangelo, not only as an artist, but as the idea of an artist. And as you can see, he is uh, elected to paint himself against the backdrop of the uh, uh, free, the Elgin marbles, uh, the Parthenon frieze, which was built into his studio house. And he was to become yet more eminent. If we move, he lived for 16 years after that portrait was painted. And at the time of his death in 1896, he, ha he had just been ennobled by um, uh, Queen Victoria, so he remains the only British artist to have re received that accolade. He's also actually one of the shortest lived peers of the realm in that he died before he'd actually made it to the House of Lords. And in fact, the press speculated as to whether or not he should be referred to as Lord Leighton or not. Um, and to give an indication of uh, the position he'd established for himself, Queen Victoria personally intervened and issued a statement to say that in her opinion, which really was the only one that counted, he should be referred to as Lord Leighton. He was buried in St. Paul's Cathedral in a ceremony that was effectively a national event. The streets lined with people, and he was interred in the crypt immediately adjacent to the plot of Sir Christopher Wren, the architect of St. Paul's, and in the north aisle of St. Paul's Cathedral, there remains a very prominent monument to him by, by the sculptor Thomas Brock. So he really, in the course of his lifetime, been able to establish an unrivaled position at the heart of the uh, artistic establishment of his time. And it's not difficult to see a parallel in the evolution of his house. So if we look at this light, the image below, on the left is the house as it was first built, its first incarnation in the mid-1860s. And then on the right-hand side, what had become a private palace of art, with that house now subsumed in later editions, both on its east side and its west side, the house had only just been completed because over the 30 years that Leighton lived there, he was almost constantly fiddling with the house in some way, either extending it or embellishing it in some way. The last of those editions only completed months before this drawing was made and published, as you can see from the caption, in a French architectural periodical and recording the house in its final incarnation. 
So the simple thing to say is that somehow this house, Leighton's house, embodied him, that it in some way manifested himself through its construction. But in fact, I think it was a more subtle relationship between himself and his house. But that doesn't uh, uh, take away the fact that it was clearly identified as something that was of central importance to him. His sisters referred to it as an object of his loving care, a joy to him until he lay down to die. Terms you might think might refer to a child rather than to, to this house that he had, um, he had created. Um, and this perhaps indicates one of the oddities of the house. It only has one bedroom. There is no guest accommodation within it. Um, this signals perhaps the first, which we'll look at in more detail, the first in indication of this tension there is with this in the house between its private function and its the, uh, public access, which was always part of its conception. Uh, so he occupied this bedroom, and it was the room, in fact, in which he died. And it's just the first indication of the extent to which this house was so personal to him. It served a number of functions. Principally, it was his workspace. So all the pictures of his mature career were painted in the studio on the first floor of the house. He worked, his whole life was governed by great self-discipline and great rigor in the way that he maintained and used his time. Um, and that particularly applied to his work. So he would work every day. Um, Although we know he had some studio assistants, he never acknowledged it and stated that he always worked alone. Um, he would work on four or five compositions at once, all of which were underpinned by an absolute rigor in um, the use of drawing that underpinned the whole of his artistic practice and production. And we have within the museum 700 of his drawings that, that give an indication of how central that was to him. So it was a workspace. It was also a display space, and this is something that has become in more and more focus over recent years. And that is the extent to which the design and decoration of the house responded to objects that were in Leighton's possession, that his collections of fine and decorative art. It was certainly not the case that he built it and then looked for things with which he could furnish and, and um, decorate it. He absolutely had a sense of what was going to go where and how the house would be organized in relation to his collections. And this was done in a very subtle and sophisticated way in several instances and climaxed in his construction of the Arab Hall, which we'll look at in more detail. The third element um, was as a space for entertainment. And this took several forms. Its most basic was that Leighton was at home on a Sunday afternoon, conversing as was described in a princely manner, moving from one language to another. He spoke five languages fluently. Um, so he was at home on a Sunday afternoon. There were two key set piece events in the calendar that the house really came into its own. One was Show Sunday, where the pictures for that year's Royal Academy exhibition were unveiled for the first time. And the second was a music, a musical recital that was held in the spring every year in the studio. But then it was accessible in all kinds of other ways. Leighton himself could be persuaded to give a guided tour of his own house. This image here suggests a kind of open day where women here have come to view that recently, um, this group of women have come to view the recently completed uh, Arab Hall. Um, young artists with letters of introduction from colleagues of Leighton or friends of Leighton, there are many accounts of them turning up at the house and Leighton taking the time to show them through and uh, uh, welcome them. And he also participated in a scheme whereby what was described of, as the poor were given admittance to the house to view the ground floor of it in Leighton's absence, but with the idea that this was to the, their betterment and the appreciation of beauty could only be a, a good thing. So it was always conceived with the idea that it would be to some degree a public space. And there was one particular segment or audience that were particularly welcome, and that was the press or writers on art who um, were invited to the house or would make an appointment with Leighton. Um, they would be shown around by him. And by looking at these different accounts of the house, it's quite clear that Leighton had a kind of tour which he, he re revealed the same objects from his collection, seems to have said more or less the same thing about them to each journalist. And what would result, and this is a typical example uh, published in The Strand in 1892, 
would be something that has been compared to, not by me, but by uh, somebody else, as a kind of Hello magazine before Hello magazine, in that uh, the artist is using their environment, um, the house in which, which they have created, as a means of projecting an identity or confirming an identity about themselves um, and in which their collections and their choices and the way they have designed and decorated their house become central to the creation of that image. And it's certainly the case that Leighton was very well disposed to, we know from the number of articles that were published not only in the UK, but in the States, on the continent, even as far afield as Australia, um, that the house was used to some extent as a means of projecting this identity. And then the final function of it is that in many ways the most intriguing. And this is where a private palace of art becomes a private home. Because Leighton lived in this house, as far as we know, for 30 years alone. And this image rather poignantly shows his dining table laid just for himself. He traveled a great deal, but as far as we know, he always traveled alone. He ate out at his club at the Athenaeum and there are a number of comments which suggest he always ate alone. So there's this very solitary aspect to him. And Leighton, in fact, appeared uh, in a fictionalized form in two um, works of literature at this time, one by Benjamin Disraeli. He appears as Mr. Phoebus, an artist in the novel Lothair. And then in a Henry James short story called The Private Life, um, there is a character called Lord Mellifont, who is commonly perceived to be Leighton, and uh, there is speculation about this character, Lord Mellifant, about who he is, does he exist in private, or is he just a perfect performer um, uh, when in public? And there is a sentence in that, uh, in that short story which says, how was he at home, and what did he do when he was alone? And I think this absolutely is a question we can ask of, of Leighton once he was, the door had shut in his private palace of art. So the talk will... Um, effectively take the form of a tour through the house and try and explore how those themes we've just looked at were played out in its conception and construction and in the way the collection was um, arranged uh, within it. So it's a tour with some digressions along the way. But first I wanted just to paint in a little picture of the Leighton family. So here he is, the second of three children, two further children had died in infancy, of his father, a, a doctor, Frederick Septimus Leighton, um, who, although trained as a doctor, um, hardly practiced, partly because of being hard of, of hearing. Um, and then his mother, Augusta, who suffered clearly from ill health throughout his childhood and died relatively young. And the need for the family to seek a, a better climate in which to live motivated or was one of the motivations for their very peripatetic lifestyle that they enjoyed as Leighton grew up. Um, the figure who's missing and is perhaps the most significant figure in the Leighton story and that in fact is his grandfather James Leighton who had emigrated to St. Petersburg and ended up being the um, uh, private physician and a coucheur to the Imperial Russian royal family. Um, and in that capacity he uh, was also made at a kind of honorary position of the chief medical officer for the Imperial Russian Navy and became a privy councillor in St. Petersburg. Um, and so it was in St. Petersburg that um, uh, uh, his, uh, Leighton's father, Frederick, uh, spent the early years after his marriage and it was there that Alexandra, Leighton's sister, was born. Alexandra being the name of the Tsarina, who was his, her godmother, Leighton was then born back in England, in Scarborough, on the northeast coast of England, where again the family had retreated for the sake of his mother's health. And then Augusta, the younger sister, uh, born in London in 1835. And recently I've been transcribing the journal that Augusta kept for the year 1857, when the family are living in Bath, that we have in the collection at Leighton House. And it's very revealing as a little snapshot of this family, presumably at the kind of age, we don't know when these photographs were taken, but the, in their early 20s. And several things come across that are, I think, uh, quite revealing. The first is what a very intellectual family it was. Leighton's father um, had given up, uh, as I say, medical practice and seems to have devoted himself to the education of his, uh, of his children, not always altogether supportively, 
there's some correspondence where Leighton, as a young, uh, young artist, tries to engage his father uh, in Hegel's writings on aesthetics. And his father more or less says to him, don't bother trying to understand that. You, you, it is not really, uh, you're not in a position to understand the context of those writings. You should just concentrate on being an artist. Um, and there are references in Augusta's journal that suggest the father is, if not a tyrannical figure, certainly a, a, stern, uh, a stern figure. She compares the life of uh, provincial families in Bath with that of her own family. And while rather condescending about their intellectual pretensions, she sees the environment that they live in as a warm, supportive family and contrasts it with her own. The second thing she makes great play of is, is Leighton Frederick as really the star of the family, as the golden boy. He, at the time uh, she's keeping her journal is in Paris, but he's clearly seen by his sisters as um, um, a, a wonderful brother in every, uh, in every respect. And then the final thing that is a particular concern of hers is about her own identity in that she struggles with uh, how, whether to decide she is English or in fact she wakes up some days and feels very German. And this is for a particular uh, reason, that is the family effectively grew up uh, in Germany. So they had left this country, uh, sorry, left the United Kingdom in the uh, early 1840s. Um, and then settled in Frankfurt in uh, 1846, buying a large house there. And it was in 1846 that Leighton enrolled at the Stadel uh, at, uh, Kunstinstitut, at the art school there, where he came under the guidance, and what he described as the indelible seal of his uh, painting master uh, von Steinle, Edward von Steinle, a Nazarene artist and that the influence of the Nazarene Brotherhood was very much in, in play at the art school at the time that Leighton was there. And on the left is the work that is currently at Leighton House, part of the Leighton House collections, that Leighton produced almost as his diploma piece, as his final work before leaving uh, the Stadel. Um, he took as his subject the death of Brunelleschi, of the architect whose dying wish was to be taken to see the dome of uh, the cathedral in Florence as his great work, um, depicted here uh, in the background, Leighton taking artistic license sufficient to change the red roof to, to gray. Um, and Leighton used his father as the graying figure in the background and his sister Alexandra in the foreground uh, within the composition, which takes the form of, a, of an altarpiece. Um, I should mention that no lesser figure than David Hockney, who lives very close to Leighton House in London, once stood me in front of this picture and told me how the perspective was entirely wrong um, and the, uh, the space which is occupied by the group at the front does not tally with the architectural uh, setting behind them. I felt at the time uh, unable to question such an authority. Um, but uh, this work was painted by Leighton apparently in secret, as it were. He wouldn't let anybody see it and I think quite typically then revealed it to the unsuspecting uh, fellow students who were all immediately amazed and impressed by his accomplishment. It's a very substantial work, almost three metres by two metres. Um, and it was bought by Leighton House from the son of von Steinler, who must have been left it by Leighton when he, he left Germany to make his way to Rome. And it was with the pointed intention of going to Rome to paint the pictures with which he would launch his professional career. And he embarked, and again I think it's revealing of Leighton's personality, not on two pictures that were relatively modest in their ambition in order to get the ball rolling. In fact, he embarked on two very substantial complex compositions. What you see here is the colour sketch for one of those, and that was entitled Cimabue's Celebrated Madonna is Carried in Procession Through the Streets of Florence. That's actually its abbreviated title because it then goes on to list all the artists who are uh, in the procession, and the second work was the reconciliation of the Montagues and Capulets over the dead bodies of Romeo and Juliet. And it's clear from every, those that encountered Leighton, again, still in his early 20s in Rome, um, that they were enormously enamored and impressed by him as a personality, and equally by his, his facility as an artist. And it is as though Leighton really laid out and made everybody very aware of his abilities. He produced this wonderful series of drawings. This is just three of more than 20 uh, very fine pencil studies that were made for almost every head within the, in the procession. And in fact, he never again produced 
such fine preparatory studies in this way. He then produced the colour sketch, and this was added to the collections at Leighton House when it was bought here in New York in 2012, and I know some of those in the audience played an instrumental part in making that, uh, making that happen. And Leighton havered over which of these two pictures he would send to London and which he would send to the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1855. In the end, he decided to send the Chimmy Bui uh, painting to London, to the Royal Academy, and the idea that the Academy would give over 17 feet of wall space to a work by an artist who they never, nobody knew of, and in fact there is a, a, a very interesting letter written by um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti once the picture has gone on exhibition, in which he tries very hard not to like it, but in the end can't quite bring himself not to like it. Um, so the idea the Academy would give over this amount of wall space to a work by an unknown artist was a long shot, but in fact it was not only selected but well hung. And on the first day of the exhibition, Queen Victoria, prompted by Prince Albert, bought it. So it remains one of the great debut, um, debuts of any British artist, appearing uh, from nowhere and his first work being immediately bought, uh, bought by the Queen. But Leighton did not then follow this up by coming back from Rome to London and picking up his career immediately. Instead, he diverted and went to Paris. Um, and this was Paris of the era when Whistler was there, um, Val Princep, who had become his neighbor, was there, the group of artists who were fictionalized through, through George de Maurier's Trilby. Um, but Leighton very definitely did not take up with the British contingent and instead sought out the company of French artists. He met Angle, he met Delacroix, and this is Delacroix's studio, he met Corot, um, he met Manet, and he met Ari Scheffer, and you can see the painting of uh, Ari Scheffer's studio, significant because Scheffer organized musical recitals within this studio space, and I think that helped form Leighton's um, ideas around the studio that he would one day build, because between Rome and Paris, he had innumerable opportunities to see the way that artists combined their living and working space. And I think all the time he was absorbing these ideas and as, as to how he might conceive of his own studio house. But in fact, the years after that Chimabui triumph were, in, were the most difficult of Leighton's career. This was the work that followed it up, or at least this is the color sketch for it. The, um, it's the triumph of music, and it was an absolute critical disaster. Universally um, um, compared as inferior to the Chimabui uh, picture, Leighton is believed to have then taken it off its stretcher and hidden it away. Such was his uh, disappointment uh, at its reception. This is, as I say, the color sketch, which is the only record of the painting. Um, and this started what really almost appears to have been a campaign against him from within the ranks of the Royal Academy, quite possibly because it, he was seen as a foreign-trained artist. And in some way, this disgruntled the established Royal Academicians. So there was then a series of pictures. Nothing was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1857. This picture, Count Paris, um, exhibited in 1858, but hung over a doorway, so it was virtually invisible. In the following year, 1859, he exhibited a series of pictures uh, of the famous Roman model Nana Risi, of which this Pavonia has become one of the absolute icons of, well, of Victorian painting and of, of the aesthetic movement. Um, but because they were not these large history subjects, um, they weren't considered to be or taken uh, with, uh, as entirely uh, with the weight that they, they might have done. Uh, the following year, he exhibited just a single work, a landscape. He virtually never exhibited any landscape ever again. And there is a sense, as these pictures emerged, of him rather casting around as his identity as an artist is questioned and looking for a path that he can really um, follow. Uh, this is his 1861 submission. Eight pictures were submitted, two were rejected. This was Lida Onoverta, another picture that plays a central role in, in the birth or the uh, development of this aesthetic movement in, in a subjectless picture of this androgynous youth, these extraordinary um, draperies against a, an architectural setting very unspecific in its, its geographical uh, location. 
and then a, a, a further work from 1862, Odalisque. And as this campaign, or as Leighton faced these rejections and difficulties, um, John Everett Millet, Holman Hunt, uh, and Rossetti himself, his pre-Raphaelite contemporaries, all came to his defense and argued that he was being uh, badly treated. So despite the wonderful richness of these images, it was not until 1864, with the exhibition of Dante in exile at the Royal Academy, which was bought by the art dealer Ernest Gambart for just over a thousand pounds, that seemed to give Leighton uh, both a financial confidence to embark on building his studio, but also led to his election as an associate of the Royal Academy. So that Chimabui picture was virtually a decade before this, and so it was a very difficult and slow process for his actual acceptance by the Academy. And of course, the irony of this is that he would become such a champion of the Academy as its president and would be seen to, to embody it in later life, um, but he certainly had a difficult time early on. So it was clear that he had the intention of building a house when he felt he was in a position to do so. And that started in 1864, and the setting of it and the site of it was very specific. And it was all bound up with an extraordinary household that had evolved at this house called Little Holland House. This was the dower house for um, the Jacobean mansion of Holland House uh, in Kensington, west of London. Um, it acted as the dower house, a rambling, as you can see, rather picturesque um, house, which was leased in 1851 by a couple called Toby and Sarah Princep. Um, Sarah Princep's maiden name was Pattle, and the Princeps and Pattles had had a long association with the administration of India. So Toby had been an Indian um, civil servant and retired back to this country and took the lease on this house. Sarah was one of the five Pattle sisters. Another of the sisters was Julia Margaret Cameron, the photographer, but they were all renowned for their beauty, their erudition, and their slight bohemian tinge, which was expressed in their dresses, these very self-consciously artistic, um, loose-fitting dresses. So that was one of the attractions of Little Holland House. A second was George Frederick Watts, the artist who's shown here with Sophia Dalrymple, one of the, the Patel sisters, who in this famous expression came to stay for the weekend and lived there for 25 years. And he sort of became the artist in residence. Um, um, and there's a wonderful uh, comment by uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti writing to Edward Byrne Jones in which he describes this household. He says, you must know these people, Ned. They are remarkable people. You will see a painter there. He paints a queer sort of picture about God and creation. And this is no doubt an allusion to Watts. And uh, here we have one of the frescoes, which is part of the collections at Leighton House Museum, which, Frotz, uh, which uh, Watts used to decorate the interiors of Little Holland House. And when Burne Jones became ill at the end of the 1850s, he retreated and convalesced as part of this this household. So it became a great meeting place for London's literary and cultural um, uh, society. And no doubt Leighton, Frederick Leighton, although still living abroad, became aware of this household and seems through it to have become aware of two plots of land that were being offered for sale nearby. And this uh, is a map that shows the two arrows um, where Leighton was to embark on building his house and immediately to its left, where Val Princep, the son of Toby and Sarah, who'd been trained by George Frederick Watts, he also embarked on building a studio house at the same moment. Um, Little Holland House was just off this map to the north, and so you can see immediately to the rear of Leighton's um, intended house was in fact the working farm of the Holland estate, which gives an idea of still the very rural aspect or the rural setting in which Leighton was embarking on building his home. And here are these two neighbours. They would remain neighbours for 30 years. On the left, Val Princep, photographed by his cousin as our royal cousin. And in fact, he makes a very convincing Henry VIII, perhaps more boxer than artist, you might uh, think. And then on the right, this wonderful uh, cartoon of Leighton by Tiso in it from 1872, where he's depicted really as the embodiment of the aesthete, with his prominent lily in his buttonhole, uh, his luxuriant hair and beard, um, although still slightly a feat almost and solitary in the suggestion of the three graces 
hovering in the distance, but Leighton keeping himself rather removed from them. But the two remained great friends throughout the 30 years that they were neighbours, and in 1884, Leighton was best man to Princep at his marriage to Florence Leyland, the uh, daughter of Frederick Leyland, the great uh, Liverpool ship owner and great art collector. And of course, Whistler's wonderful portrait of Leyland's wife, uh, Florence, is on display outside next to uh, Flaming June. And the differences in their character and their backgrounds is exemplified in the architects they chose to build their houses. So um, Princep commissioned Philip Webb, who had already, through the building of this extraordinary red house for William Morris at Bexley Heath to the east of London in 1858, had established himself as the leading, the principal architect associated with the arts and crafts movement, quoting, but in a very innovative way, traditional or vernacular architecture with its steep pitched roofs, brick construction, and you can see something of this was carried over into Princeps House here on the uh, illustration on the top left. This is the house in its first incarnation, very picturesque with, as you can see, numerous points of reference to the Red House. Following his marriage to Leyland's um, daughter, he in fact effectively ruined his house by adding an enormous extension at the back to contain a music room and a ballroom, as though every artist uh, uh, needed such a thing. So while Princep was associating himself with an emerging arts and crafts tradition, Leighton went a very different route. He selected for his architect somebody called George Aitchison, seen here on the right. Leighton had met Aitchison in Rome when Leighton was working on his Cimabui picture, and in fact Aitchison recounted how he posed for a sleeve of one of the figures um, in, the, in the painting. Aitchison had never built a house before. He came from a family of architects, but that practice specialised, as you can see here, in one of uh, Aitchison's earlier works, in warehouses, wharves, docks, uh, railway architecture. So entirely removed uh, in background from uh, a studio uh, house. But Aitchison would remain the only architect to be involved in all the phases of the development of Leighton House hereafter. And I think, in fact, from Leighton's perspective, his lack of um, credentials, if you like, as, a, a, as an architect, was in his favour, because it allowed Leighton to become very involved himself in every aspect of the design and decoration of the house. And it was a theme that was picked up by other uh, architects working for artists. The sort of uh, duality of having a client who is more open, more adventurous in their outlook, but has very strong views of what the house might look like and the difficulty of juggling those two things. But by associating himself, I think, with Aitchison, Leighton was, was making sure that he could not be pigeonholed very easily in the way that this house was going to be conceived and uh, designed. Leighton, um, Aitchison's career was entirely transformed by his association with Leighton, not uh, that it led to any other studio house um, commissions, what it did lead to was a series of what must have been extraordinary interior schemes for very wealthy clients in central London. And many of these clients were already a, a collectors of Leighton's work. And a number of them became um, collaborative commissions. So we see here the earliest of them from 1869, when uh, this was for a client, Percy Wyndham, a politician and um, uh, collector. Um, this is of the staircase of the house where Leighton um, contributed five life-size panels. These are just two of them, which you can see were set against this dark blue background at the top of the staircase, which must have, must have really been spectacular. And then a second um, great patron of Leighton's, a banker called uh, Stuart Hodgson, James Stuart Hodgson, uh, commissioned a house in uh, South Audley Street in Mayfair in London, and again, Aitchison, uh, was commissioned to work on the interiors, and Leighton, rather reluctantly, it has to be said, was commissioned to, or agreed to contribute two friezes to the uh, interiors, to the drawing room interiors, as you can see here. So, from Aitchison's perspective, his association with Leighton was a, entirely a beneficial one. He became, when Leighton was the president of the Royal Academy, professor of architecture at the Royal Academy, and ultimately did become the uh, president of the RIBA. And so here is Leighton's house in its first incarnation. Um, 
and in fact it remained the case throughout the time that Leighton lived there, the comment was how unrevealing of itself the house was from the exterior. And in fact, it was set in quite a modest lane running across the, the bottom of the Holland estate. And numerous descriptions of the house comment on the fact that you could approach it and have no in inclination or understanding of what was to evolve um, behind the facade. And it's perhaps fanciful or stretches a point to suggest there's something of Leighton's personality in that. This idea of a, a rather unknowable exterior, um, but inter, once you get beyond that, this extraordinarily rich um, uh, uh, individual. The other thing just to point out here is on the right-hand side, you can just make out, I think if I point, this. And this was the uh, doorway for the model. And it's one of the specific things about not just this studio house, but many of these studio houses that were built in London at the same time, is the great lengths that, were, that the architect and owner went to to manage the way the model came in and out of the house. They didn't go through the front door or through the servant's door. They had a dedicated third entrance only for the use of the model, so that an unaccompanied young woman coming and going through that door could not be mistaken for any other um, coming to the house for any other purpose than for modelling uh, for the artist. And in many of the uh, studio houses built at this time, they would enter a staircase that would lead into the studio and then out of it again. So they had no way of coming into contact with any other part of the uh, household. The other, I suppose, initial question is how far was Leighton involved in the design of this? There are certainly descriptions where it says that every brick was subject to his approval um, as it went, went up. And he certainly was interested in architecture, but whether he quite deserved the gold medal for architecture awarded by, by the RIBA to him in 1894 is rather doubtful. It's a wonderful citation where the RIBA says they're awarding him the gold medal, which is the highest accolade a professional architect could receive on the grounds of what a great architect he would have been if he'd been one, which <laughs> seems, uh, seems good going to me. So this is the street facade and the immediate contrast with the reverse, the garden facade facing north and very Greek in inspiration, dominated by the studio window on the first floor, which was actually later changed from stone construction to cast iron. Um, and despite its artistic pretensions, perhaps it's not all t entirely possible to forget that image of the warehouse that uh, appeared earlier on. And Aitchison, like so many of his generation of architects, were really wrestling with the idea of what was the appropriate style for the age in which they lived and understood that the simple rehearsal of classical motifs or Gothic ornament was no longer really valid. And, and, and Aitchison wrote about the, the idea that in the end, buildings will simply become constructed of glass and, and iron. Um, and there is something in his construction of this. We know that when a later edition was added, one of Leighton's neighbours, a fellow artist, commented to somebody that the foundations were sufficient to hold up the Eiffel Tower. And I think there was, I mean, it's played out in how robust and well, how strong the house is today, that it was built uh, by somebody who certainly knew a lot about um, construction. But there was immediately this contrast between the exterior of the house and the interiors. As it was first planned, you entered down a narrow corridor that then opened out into the staircase hall at the heart of the house. And there's two things to point out here. One is how eclectic the collections were that Leighton had already assembled. This is from an architectural uh, magazine or journal published in 1876. Um, you can see in the, um, the far wall um, a collection of tiles that he presumably had collected on his first trip to Turkey in 1867, a Japanese lantern hanging from the ceiling, a cast of Narcissus from Pompeii on the left, um, a Turkish marriage chest converted into uh, a seat on the staircase, and then dominating the staircase uh, built uh, with a frame built into the wall um, you can just see the bottom of a copy, not by Leighton, but by a Parisian artist, um, of the creation of Adam, part of the Sistine Chapel uh, ceiling. And I think there's no accident there that that piece of space was dedicated from the start to that work, so that as you uh, climbed the stairs to approach the studio where Leighton would be, this was a not altogether subtle suggestion of the kind of art that you perhaps might have in mind as you approached 
um, the studio. So this great eclectic uh, taste in, as Leighton as a collector, but then a very specific architectural setting. And we know that Leighton loved Venetian art, and um, in one of the many trips he made to Venice, there is an account of him visiting interiors, Venetian domestic interiors. Um, and here it seems to be that he quoted, between himself and Aitchison, the um, staircase at the rear of the Palazzo Gentani, a mid-15th century palazzo, which follows the model of having the staircase as an open space at the back of the house. And you can just see in the basic arrangement of the forms here, the fact that Leighton's staircase was lit from above by a very large skylight, that that is perhaps what this was being uh, based on, something very specific that suggests that um, uh, this is about the vision of somebody um, uh, precisely being realized. If you move then beyond this staircase, you then entered the dining room of the house. Um, Leighton always, according to one of the early biographies of him, sat on a chair slightly higher than everybody else's when he was entertaining um, here. But what's significant is that the little sketch at bottom right, and I'm afraid it's not a great uh, slide, is in a sketchbook of Leighton's at the Royal Academy. And what it shows is clearly this elevation, the fireplace elevation of this room, where he has sketched in these arched niches and sketched in that there are going to be these plates arranged in this circular pattern within those niches. So from the very start, the conception is a means of displaying part of his collection. And the fact that red, as all the contemporary accounts of the house confirmed, red was the dominant color, as you can see in the top right slide of this interior, suggests that it was conceived decoratively that the red would be a foil for the display of the blue and white uh, ceramics that were going to be uh, put on display in it. The other thing to point out is this large sideboard that stands against the wall on the right-hand side. And this was one of a suite of furniture, uh, seven pieces of furniture, designed specifically for the interiors of the house by George Aitchison and Leighton. And they were uh, inlaid with the motifs, inlaid in mother of pearl and ivory, with the same motifs that were inlaid into the architraves of the doors within the house. So they were very specific to the conception of it. Um, very sadly, um, they were sold like everything else, as I'll explain in a minute. But we have very frustratingly in the archive of the museum a letter not offering back some of this original furniture, but in fact a letter declining the offer of some of this original furniture in the 1920s on the grounds that it was too big and no longer served any practical purpose. And it's never been uh, seen uh, since. But that does introduce uh, uh, the moment to explain what happened after Leighton died in 1896. He left everything to his two sisters that we saw earlier, and he seems to have made them aware of bequests that he wished to make. Um, they initially thought that they would try and sell the house uh, to raise money to settle the bequests that he had intended to make, and they would sell it intact with all of the collections arranged within it. They couldn't find a buyer uh, uh, to do that, so the only uh, option then was to try and sell the house at auction. It didn't sell at auction, and the auctioneer wrote a rather apologetic note, but saying, don't blame me, but it's only got one bedroom, so how can I uh, <laughs> sell that? So then the only option left was to sell the contents of the house. So at Christie's in the summer after Leighton died, uh, an eight-day sale entirely dispersed the collections that he had built up, and which he had formed this house to contain. So it remains a great uh, tragedy in many ways that that is, uh, that is what happened. Um, it got worse. Uh, the house was very significantly bomb damaged twice in the Second World War, and the image on the left shows just what a bad state it was in. Fortunately, the damage was at this end of the house and not at the Arab Hall end, which you'll see in a minute. And um, on the right-hand side, is the dining room as it appeared in its post-war reincarnation. When the house was restored after the war, it was done simply to make it functional and usable again, and in no way to replicate as it had originally appeared. We move from the dining room next door into the drawing room of the house, and there's an immediate contrast, both in its decorative um, uh, uh, elements and in the aspect of Leighton's collection that was presented here. 
So where we had a red room with his uh, display of Iznik ceramics, we moved next door into the drawing room of the house where he displayed his collection of landscape paintings. And central to those were the four panels of the Times of the Day by Corro that he had acquired just at the point that he was building the house. And if not the first, he was amongst the very first British collectors to acquire works by Corot in the, uh, uh, and display them. And it's possible that the house was built so that these four panels, as you can see in the photograph, two to the left of the window and two to the right, were that this room was designed to accommodate them. And even, it's not fanciful, I think, to suggest that that bay window, um, where you are very conscious of the passage of the sun, was also um, that the pictures were installed in relation to that window, so that as the times of the day um, passed, you, you, you were conscious of that in the way the, the room was lit. Certainly, the sketch by Delacroix that laid no not at uh, the top left, it's no accident that there's a circular ceiling there and that this work was installed in that circular ceiling. So again, it's finding the house was being formed to display particular aspects of his collection. This is how that room looks now. And we commissioned, as part of the restoration work, an artist to make copies of these four coros. They have just, the originals have just entered the collections, having been on loan there for a long time, of the National uh, Gallery. But we thought this was very important to do because Leighton always referred to them when he was taking visitors round. But also, when we were researching the textiles in order to uh, reinstate them within the house, Somebody who was helping with that found an order book which suggested that there was an order for Leighton um, for a baize fabric, and many of the descriptions of this room suggest it was a fabric that lined the walls, not a wallpaper. Well, this order book had been transcribed, so it says order for Leighton, and it says color to match color of carrots. Well, of course, the transcription is wrong. What they mean is coros, and so again, it's the idea that that the color scheme, the decorative scheme, is being inspired by or relates to the keynotes contained within the paintings and that there is a, a consideration of them together. We move then through into the Narcissus Hall and this is the later addition to the house, um, built uh, a little over a decade after the first house that we saw earlier had been completed. Um, this was the linking space, now we refer to it as the Narcissus Hall, then it was referred to as the corridor uh, that connected the staircase hall through to the Arab hall beyond. I show this just to show it cocooned as the restoration work was done and then as it now appears with these wonderful peacock blue tiles by the potter ceramicist William de Morgan um, that were installed within the house. And again there's a connection here between the location of this sculpture of Narcissus and we saw in that earlier image Leighton owned it before he built this extension. And it seems that this space was conceived and created as a way in which that, that sculpture could find a particular setting. In that a number of descriptions of the time refer to the fact that, the, and you can see it in this image, how the blue tiles are reflected in this silvery golden ceiling um, to create a mirrored watery effect. And that this was a deliberate reference to the story of Narcissus, of the youth who catches his own reflection in a pool of water and falls in love with his own reflection. So that that is what is going on here, a, a staging for this particular item. Of course, the problem is that scholars no longer think that this is Narcissus, so <laughs> the whole thing has rather fallen apart at that point. We then move through to what this house, Leighton House, is best known for, the Arab Hall, um, built uh, between 1877 and 1881. And despite its fame, it is in fact still something of a puzzle in that Leighton didn't ever write, or if he did, it doesn't survive, anything about why he built it or how he went about building it. All that we know is a comment that was reported secondhand at a dinner party where Leighton apparently said he had built it for the sake of something beautiful to look at once in a while. A more aesthetic informed uh, uh, statement you would uh, struggle to find. But we know in 1867 he travelled to Turkey, in 1868 he went to Egypt, and in 1873 he was in Damascus, and, it, and there is a detailed account of his visit to Damascus, and it's clear that on these expeditions he was collecting material with the, um, um, for his, his collections. But was he collecting that material because he had in mind the idea of building this, or, as is suggested in, again in an early biography, that he was sitting upstairs in his studio with Aitchison, his architect, 
and they are surrounded by piles of tiles. And it's Aitchison who says to Leighton, you should build something to put these in. And he sort of says, well, OK. <laughs> um, and it seems very improbable that it was quite as spontaneous uh, as that. Um, but once they embarked uh, on it, it's clear that Leighton very definitely had a model in mind. And that model was not uh, where you might think it to be. This is a painting that has only just surfaced by Leighton um, of the uh, Capella Palatina in um, Palermo in Sicily um, with these wonderful Byzantine mosaics from the, um, uh, from the middle of the 12th century. Um, so this is, has only just appeared and is confirmation that Leighton was in Sicily, although it, we don't actually know how often and precisely when he was there. But it's easy to see that that may have informed his thinking because there is a very definite Sicilian model for the Arab Hall, and that is this palace called Laziza, a little later than the Capella Palatina, um, but again a Sicilio-Norman um, uh, palace. And it has within it a central hall that has the same plan as the Arab Hall. It has a gold mosaic frieze, as you can see in the far distance, has uh, columns in the angles of the walls, as you can see here, has a pool in its centre. So all the elements that you see in the Arab Hall are present here. And in fact, Walter Crane, um, the very versatile designer Walter Crane, in his memoirs said that he was shown a photograph of the mosaics from Laziza and asked to do something similar. And you can see how similar that was here in this comparison. So here are the original mosaics from Laziza, and here is Walter Crane's interpretation, taking that same round rule as his inspiration. Here's a carved capital from Laziza, and here is the capital by the sculptor Edgar Bohm, a great favorite of, of the royal family, um, um, which clearly, again, is similar enough to feel that he was asked to do something very much along the same line. So they were quite specific in trying to base Leighton's Arab Hall on these interiors. Um, this simply shows uh, the restoration of the dome of the Arab Hall, because all the contemporary accounts make a great play of how Colored, these colored glass windows, illum the light coming through them illuminates the dome in this spectacular way. But it had been painted over at some point. We don't know exactly when. And so in the recent restoration, we carried out extensive um, paint analysis to reveal the original decorative scheme. Um, that was then regilded, And then this is a view from uh, beneath showing the geometry of the Arab Hall and this restored golden dome. And in fact, um, originally, uh, Burne Jones wrote that he, together with Walter Crane, was supposed to be let loose on the dome to create gold mosaic decoration, but that that never happened. And in fact, Burne Jones was one of the few dissenting voices. He didn't like the Arab Hall. He felt it was a great shame that these wonderful original tiles from uh, Damascus um, were entrapped in this, this uh, construction. And here's an image of the house um, and of the Arab Hall as it was presented in Leighton's day. And it begs the question, well, what was this for? Why did he build this extension? And it really seems to be the most extreme version of this same idea of creating a setting for a particular group of objects. So here, what he's doing is creating an atmospheric, evo evocative setting at which this collection of tiles, most of which date from the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, and as a collection of of tiles are as significant as any uh, in any British uh, museum, it allowed them to be seen um, and appreciated in this, in this way. What it doesn't, there's no evidence that Leighton himself played out a kind of Arabian Nights fantasy within this room. And as you can see, even in the way it's furnished, uh, with a Japanese folding screen here, a Pompeian table here, and contemporary furniture here, that in fact, it was much more eclectic than it might now appear. And I think many visitors to Leighton House now assume that Leighton was a kind of great Orientalist, when in fact it was one aspect of his interest. And really, if he painted any Orientalist pictures, they are contained within the period when he was traveling, collecting this material, and building his Arab hall. It certainly was used as a smoking room, and there is an account of a dinner at which the artists um, Albert Moore, Whistler, and Burne Jones were present. They retreat into the Arab Hall, and somebody is talking so animatedly that they walk backwards and fall into the fountain, which 
is a habit that visitors are um, unwilling to break. So, um, move then through into his little study. This is how it appeared as recently as the 1980s, and then how it appears today. And it coincides with its construction with uh, Leighton's appointment as the president of the Royal Academy. Um, and so he had a great deal of more administrative duties to attend to. Back into the Arab Hall and up the stairs. And as you climbed the stairs, you were confronted by two wonderful portraits. Um, the one we saw earlier by George Frederick Watts of Leighton that hung on the stairs. Compared to any other image of him, you get a sense, painted image of him, you get a sense of one artist friend painting another artist friend, something of the um, formality of Leighton is, is lost in, not least in his rather crumpled, um, his crumpled suit. What's very interesting about this is that this work was not sold at Christie's. It was presented by Leighton's sisters to a, a family, a landed gentry family who lived in Shropshire in England with the surname of Leighton. And the Leighton family of the artist and this family in Shropshire had sort of convinced themselves they were all related to each other. <laughs> Um, because if you go beyond Leighton's grandfather who went to St. Petersburg, the previous generation um, were coal merchants. Before that, they were innkeepers and bricklayers. And in these interviews with Leighton, it says he was willing to, do, to talk about the grandfather who went to St. Petersburg and then rather got vague about any previous ancestry. So finding this family in Shropshire was a way, posthumously, by presenting this portrait to them, of suggesting that they must be uh, uh, connected. Um, the portrait stayed within uh, that family in Shropshire until uh, about 2000, then following a detour to Australia, it has now returned to Leighton House and hangs in the position where it did originally. And then a little further on, um, Leighton's fantastic portrait of Richard Burton, the explorer and diplomat, who we know helped Leighton secure tiles during the period that uh, Burton was the British consul in Damascus. You then emerged into the silk room, and here was where Leighton organized, and I use the word organized because he very definitely arranged his collection of pictures in a, in a very deliberate way. So we're looking into what was called the silk room, added right at the end of Leighton's life as a picture gallery. Um, earlier on in the history of the museum, it had been here that for years, collections of Leighton's drawings were just displayed. And this gives a sense how, throughout the 20th century, how Leighton House rather vac vacillated between being a gallery space and a domestic, or presented as a domestic space. And here, um, just to show you the range of pictures, so we've gotten this far wall of works that had been presented to, by, to Leighton by his contemporaries. But just to start with that armorial tapestry at the top there, if you look at the back right-hand side of the image, you can see where that hung. And it hung in a recess which was top-lit. So in a kind of museological way, it was pre uh, preserved from direct sunlight, but presented in, a, in its own niche with its own lighting. And although there are a number of variants of this, I think this is now in the Metropolitan uh, here in New York. But then the other works presented to him um, Sargent with one of his studies for the Boston Public Library, a work by Giovanni Costa that we've recently acquired. Costa was a great Italian friend of Leighton's and has the uh, fame of being the only other person known to have slept at Leighton House um, in, uh, when he stayed there with his wife on one occasion. A work by Lawrence Alma Tadema that hung here, and Alma Tadema and Leighton were great Royal Academy colleagues. John Everett Millet um, in the centre there. Um, George Frederick Watts, one of his studies for his picture, Hope, um, one of the possible sources for the pose of Flaming June, a work by the artist Marie Kazan, and in the research that we did to try and trace Leighton's collection, this surfaced at the Courier Museum in Manchester, New Hampshire, and they were unaware of this connection, and the work remained in their store, so they very generously agreed to uh, sell it to us for a dollar. And so it now is returned to Leighton House and Hungs where it once did, and then Albert Moore's Vase of Dahlias, Albert Moore living for a period just 50 yards from Leighton in Holland Park Road. Then over the fireplace was arranged his Venetian collection, essentially dominated by this wonderful Tintoretto, which has returned to the museum a few, a few years ago. And Venetian, he had some 16 works by Venetian artists of the 16th century. And then on the far wall, and particularly 
uh, in relation to here. He had pictures of a century earlier, 15th century work, and the very earliest picture in his, oops, sorry, very earliest picture in his collection here by Barna de Siena, which is now um, here at the Frick. Um, it was sold at the Leighton sale to Charles Fairfax Murray, the artist and dealer, and through the good offices of Lord Duveen, found its way, as many things did, uh, here. I mentioned the Courier Museum selling the work back to Leighton House for a dollar, so perhaps I'll just leave that thought uh, <laughs> uh, with you. Um, here is the scheme by George Aitchison for this silk room, which shows, and this seems to predate the scheme, which shows the arrangement of pictures as we saw it, again emphasising how the considerations were given to how the collection we displayed as part of the conception of the rooms. And here, a view of that silk room as it now appears with a number of those works now hanging back where they once did. Um, we then emerge into the studio, and this is one of the great set-piece moments I referred to earlier. This was presumably the lineup of Leighton's pictures before they were sent to the Royal Academy of 1895. And that event was always marked by show Sunday, where not just Leighton, but by all his, uh, many of his contemporaries, would organize days where the public, and it's not quite clear on what basis the public were admitted, would come to view the house, meet the artist, and view that year's submission. And there was enormous anticipation about what these leading artists would be submitting that year, and the opportunity to go and see the works before they were sent to the Royal Academy allowed word to spread, allowed people to um, uh, talk about these pictures, and if the artist was lucky, they would in fact sell their work or could sell their work in the studio before it ever went to the Royal Academy. So again, it's the studio space being very deliberately used or where it coincides with the commercial interests uh, uh, of the artist. And of course, Flaming June uh, shown very prominently on the right-hand side. And it was also in this room where Leighton's annual music event took place every spring for the whole 30 years that he lived at the house. He had a concert at which internationally distinguished musicians would come and perform for the same audience year in, uh, year out. Um, Burne Jones wrote about how much he anticipated, how much he looked forward to these events, because it was quite often the case that the people who went would never see each other in the intervening year. They would see each other for the first time the following year. And he said how everyone would say to each other, you look not a day older than the last time I saw you, <laughs> and how difficult that Came, became to maintain as time passed and uh, things moved on. Again, an image just to show its uh, municipal appearance in the 60s and then as it's now presented back again with the view through to the silk room and the cast of the Parthenon frieze that we saw earlier used as the backdrop of Leighton's self-portrait. Um, as I mentioned, the contents of the house were sold at Christie's and entirely dispersed. And this cabinet has a very intriguing um, tale in that it was surfaced at an auction at, in 1997 in Melbourne, Australia. The person bought it and took it home and in the drawer inside found the Leighton sale catalogue of 1896 that the auction house, who shall remain nameless, had failed to notice. Um, but they contacted the museum and said, does this cabinet have anything to do with Leighton House? And as you can see from the image on the left, there it is. Um, and uh, um, uh, the owner visited the museum and we stood in front of a blank piece of wall with me rather desperately dropping hints about how nice it might be for it once to return. Um, and uh, while it was not presented back through the great good support of one of the museum's most wonderful supporters, um, it was possible to reacquire it and for it to return, having travelled around the world, exactly back to the spot where it left in uh, 1896. And then just to finish, back where we started, in Leighton's bedroom. Um, this is the surprisingly modest, almost austere bedroom, decorated in a William Morris wallpaper, where the rest of the door furniture and door architraves are bespoke here, they become standard, as though you've almost entered a different environment at all. And this absolutely emphasizes this tension, as I said, between Leighton's private personality and his public self. He, was, he could speak five languages. He was great friends with members of the royal family. In fact, somebody was once holding forth to Whistler of all of Leighton's accomplishments, the facts he could, he could sing, he was a great dancer, he, he, as I say, had these great linguistic abilities, at which Whistler shrugged his shoulders and apparently said, I hear he paints a bit too. Um, 
but so there was that public uh, side to him, but his private self remains very difficult to really feel one can grasp or understand. Uh, he seems to be very good at preserving that uh, whatever private life he enjoyed. And people who knew him, the artist William Powell Frith said, I knew Leighton for 30 years, but I don't know him yet. Um, uh, Millet described him as a solitary, self-contained man. Um, and you get some sense of that, that almost as though the rest of the house is constructed almost as a stage on which Leighton was able to inhabit or uh, perform, to use that word that Henry James used, the role of a great artist. Yet his private self was very different, required a very different set of circumstances in which he um, uh, as this only private room within the house. And it was here that he died uh, in 1896, and his last recorded words were, give my love to the Royal Academy, exactly what you'd sort of think he would say, demonstrating his devotion to that institution and to art. But according to his first biographer, um, he uh, then turned to his sisters and spoke to them in German for a prolonged period of time. So again, you're just left to speculate about what that conversation was about and the contrast between a public utterance and a private conversation. His coffin was taken across to the studio where it uh, lay um, and it was placed beneath this last work, Clytie, that he had been working on up until his um, death. It was not quite completed. Um, and it's definitely the case that in the last 10 years of his life, he produced a series of pictures which, if you like, are about the sun. And of course, Flaming June entirely falls within that sequence of pictures. And it, in Flaming June, it's the sun as its most life-enhancing, life-enriching. Um, here, it's a very different kind of idea. This is Clytie, who has been abandoned by Apollo, and she falls to her knees, imploring his return. In the end, he takes pity on her, converting her into a, sun, a flower or sunflower, forever following the course of the sun. But the reason why this picture was immediately seized on as such an appropriate image to commemorate or memorialize Leighton was, was the sense that here it's invested with something more than many of his pictures, that he was conscious of his ailing health and that there is something about him imploring the vitality of the sun's rays not to, not to depart. One can't help but think of Turner's last recorded words, which was the sun, the sun is God. And there seems to be something of the sense of that uh, in this painting, Clytie. And it was wonderful for Leighton House when we were able to acquire this work in 2008. As a little postscript, I just wanted to show you this image. I would like to say this is Leighton House every day, but it wasn't, it's not quite as busy as that. This was an exhibition that we recently had of a Mexican private collection of 52 Victorian uh, pictures which drew enormous new audiences to view the house and to see these pictures absolutely in a context in which uh, they are meaningful and made the most uh, uh, impact. And then finally, uh, a project that we are developing to convert, as you can see on the right-hand top image, additions that were made to the house in the 1920s and to use them, redevelop them, to take the pressure off the original, these wonderful interiors within the house itself to create the facilities that visitors expect within that, uh, within that wing. And by so doing, we hope preserving this extraordinary house uh, and the story it tells for, uh, for future generations. Thank you very much. The exhibition will remain open for the next 20 minutes and please join Daniel there.